Good evening, guys. Am I audible? And is the screen fine? So, good evening, guys. Let's start. And what you plan to do is take a series of sessions to cover up most of the questions that will come up for your UG exams, five marker, ten marker, as well as your short answers. Okay. So, on the newborn infants or neonatology topic. Fine. So, to get started, let's see some of the basic definitions that we need to know. Okay, so these are few of the basic definitions. So to start up with, what is a neonate? So what is neonate? Neonate accounts to first 28 days of life. That is 0 to 28 days of life, as we, as we all know. In that, there is early and late. We can divide it into early neonate and late. Okay, now so early neonate includes the initial 7 days of life. And the late neonate includes day 8 to day 28 days of life. Early is initial seven days, late is from day eight to day 28. Now, based on maturity, how do we classify them? Based on maturity, we can classify them as pre-term, term, and post-term, correct? Among this, in the pre-term, who are extreme pre-terms? Extreme pre-terms are the ones that are born less Extreme preterms are the one who are born less than 28 weeks period of gestation. Very preterms are the one who are born from 28 to 31 plus 6 weeks period of gestation. Moderate preterm are the ones who are born between 32 to 33 plus 6 weeks period of gestation. And late preterms are the one who are born between 34 to 36 plus 6 weeks period of gestation. Fine. This is to sum up. Extreme preterm, very preterm, moderate preterm, and late preterm. Just a second. Now coming to the term infants. Term infants can <coughs> term neonates can again be divided into early and late. Okay. Now early is between 37 to 38 plus six weeks period of gestation, and late is between 39 to 40. Term is more than 42 weeks. Okay. So Maturity, preterm, term, and post term. In preterm, it is extreme preterm, very preterm, moderate preterm, and late preterm. In term, it is early and late, and post term is more than 42 weeks. Now, coming to the birth weight. Based on birth weight, how do we classify neonates? Low birth weight is between 1.5 to 2.5 kg. Very low birth weight is between 1 to 1.5 kg. 
extreme low birth weight is less than 1 kg and macrosomia is more than 4 kg. So between 2.5 to 4 kg, we expect it to be normal, uh, normal birth weight newborn baby. We are somewhere between 2.5 to 3.5 kg. We expect it to be in India. Low birth weight less than 1 point, less than 2.5 kg. Among that, low birth weight is between 1.5 to 2.5. Very low birth weight is between 1.5 to 1 to 1.5. Extreme low birth weight is less than 1 kg and macrosomia is more than 4 kg. Fine. Next is based on gestational age. Now, how do we classify them based on gestational age? That is by plotting them on the intrauterine growth chart. Okay, we have something called as intrauterine growth chart. And on plotting on that growth chart, if it falls, if the neonate falls below 10th percentile, then we call them as small form gestational age. If they come between 10th to 90th percentile, then they call we call them as appropriate for gestational age. And if they fall above 90th percentile, then we call them to be large for gestational age. That is LGA babies. So SGA, AGA, that is appropriate for gestational age and large for gestational age. On After plotting them on the intrauterine growth chart, something that is say, something called as Fenton's chart. So on plotting, Fenton's chart, on plotting on this chart, if they fall, Less than 10th percentile, <coughs> SGA, 10th to 90th percentile, it is AGA, and LGA is more than 90th percentile. Next is, so after getting to know a few of these terminologies and basic of neonatology, next let's move on to the next important topic that is neonatal resuscitation. Again, you guys can be asked either five marker, 10 marker, or any three marker from this topic. So I've tried to cover this topic as a whole as a 10 marker, but anything a part of this can be asked as, asked as five marker or three marker. Okay. So coming to neonatal resuscitation. Fine. Introduction to this. So any neonate that is born initially in the intrauterine, it is the placental respiration. And once they come out to the external environment, there is the neonatal respiration. And there is a transition that has to take place because over here, it is the lungs that is function, right? And lungs are not functionable in the intrauterine period. So this transition should have to occur smoothly for newborn to breathe. If it doesn't occur, if there is abnormal transition, then comes the need for us to resuscitate the newborn child, correct? So. And this resuscitation protocol, what is given, is based on the NRP guidelines, National Resuscitation Program guidelines. And who gives this, who, which body gives this is the something called as ILCOR, International Liaison Committee of Resuscitation. Okay, so this is the body that comes up with these guidelines. Okay, and presently, eighth edition of NRP is being followed. Okay, next coming to the epidemiology. So the basic NRP, which includes up to bag and mask ventilation, okay? Tactile stimulation and positive pressure ventilation with bag and mask. So this is needed in five to 10% of cases, initial tactile stimulation. And bag and mask ventilation is needed in around three to 6% of the cases. Next is advanced NRP. And this advanced NRP includes intubation of the child along with ET tube and chest compression. Or if it still doesn't resist it, we might have to give drugs correct and this around one to three percent one to three per thousand cases okay so that will be around less than one percent okay of the babies need them fine one to three per thousand cases next is pathophysiology okay pathophysiology so what is it that causes this abnormal transition so we'll have to like when i whenever we go to research data child or whenever we we go to receive a baby in the labor room or OT, we'll have to anticipate, right? We'll have to anticipate. So based on certain risk factors, if there are any antipartum risk factors or interpartum risk factors present, so as mentioned over here, numerous risk factors are present, okay? So if any of these antipartum or interpartum risk factors are present, then we can expect the newborn child to have abnormal transition. That is when we'll have to be ready with all the things that is necessary to resuscitate the child, correct? So in the presence of these risk factors, we can expect the baby to have abnormal transition, correct? 
So what does what happens in case of abnormal transition? As we all know, if the cardiovascular system is compromised, then what the, what happens next? What happens is at the peripheral correct the peripheral vasculature constricts to pump in the blood to our heart, brain, and adrenals. Correct. So this is what happens in newborn as well. Arterials in the skin, muscles, kidney, and intestines constrict. So in if that happens in the intrauterine environment, there will be decrease in activity of the fetus or there can be fetal tachycardia or on uh, the CTG plotting, there can be loss of heart rate variability or there can be early or late deacceleration. Okay. And coming to the neonates, they manifest as gasping efforts or they can manifest as bradycardia or apnea or decreased or flaccid tone and a plain or cyanosed baby. Correct. So when this happens, and when the fetus is born in this way, if it occurs in the early phase of respiratory failure, okay, if at all it occurs in the early part of the respiratory failure, then we call it as primary apnea. And most of these newborns respond to simple tactile stimulation. So they respond to a basic neonatal resuscitation protocol, which includes either bag and mask or tactile stimulation. So they do respond to tactile stimulation. But in case this moves on to late phase of respiratory failure, then we call it as secondary apnea. And this might require positive pressure ventilation. This will require positive pressure ventilation to resuscitate the newborn child. So based on this pathophysiology, the guy, our ILCOR has come up with the NRP flow diagram. Fine. Based on this, it was designed. And this consists of five blocks. Okay. It consists of five blocks. Okay. Five different blocks. And in that, this diamond which is there is for assessment of the child. And the rectangle which is there, that gives what action to be taken. The algorithm you guys will see now. The algorithm is the one which is going to be discussed next. Okay. And as in adults, the normal circulation airway breathing is not followed. Or as in children, or the airway breathing circulation is not followed. The protocol that is followed over here in this resuscitation is the first is temperature maintenance. It is T followed by airway, breathing, circulation, and drugs. So it is T A B C T A B C D temperature, airway, breathing, circulation, and drugs. Based on this principle, based on this principle, they have come up with the flow diagram. Fine. Next. Before we move on to the algorithm as such, for the neonate to be resuscitated much before, who what are, what are the number of working hands that is needed at the time of delivery? That we need to know, correct? So for every birth, every single birth that occurs need to be attended by one trained person in basic NRP, fine? So every birth need to be attended by one trained person in basic NRP. And if any of the risk factors are present, as discussed earlier, if any of the antipartum and the risk factors are present, as we saw, see, if any of this antipartum and intrapartum risk factors are present, then what we need to do, then we obviously need to anticipate that the baby might not cry, might need resuscitation. So in that case, we need Two qualified personnel, okay. Two qualified personnel in advanced NRP is needed, okay. So, fine. Now, you are trained in basic NRP or you are trained in advanced NRP, and you go to you go into the labor room or you go into the emergency OT. You go into the OT. Fine. Over there, what happens? Over there, we'll have to first ask the four questions. We'll have to first ask four pre-birth questions. What are they? One is the gestational age. Next is whether amniotic fluid is clear or not. Next, if any additional risk factors that are present. What are the risk factors which we have already seen? If any of these risk factors are present. And next, we will have to plan umbilical cord management. If d rate cord clapping is possible or not. Okay, fine. So these are the four pre-birth questions. So once you are trained in NRP, you go into the labor room. You ask these four pre-birth questions. Okay, next you receive the baby. Birth of the child has taken place. Fine. So, as we already know, diamond stands for assessment and rectangle stands for action. Okay. First, you'll have to assess what are the three things which you're going to assess whether the child is term or not, whether the child is having good universally flexed tone, whether the baby is crying 
or not or for that matter even if it's not crying whether the baby is breathing or not if yes the child will go to the mother's side we will have to do skin to skin contact and start with the routine newborn care if no if any to if question to any of this is no then we go ahead to bring the child to uh, the crib the temperature crib which is present and first thing what you do is warm the child with pre warm linen then we dry the child then what we do is stimulate the child just by flicking the sole or by rubbing the back we stimulate the child okay so warm the baby dry the child stimulate the child then we position the child how do we position the child we we'll have to slightly extend the neck as compared to the neck so we we'll have to slightly extend the head as compared to the neck okay so this is called sniffing down position fine we we'll have to position next is we we'll have to clear the airway correct so we we'll have to open up the airway and suction if needed so what are the six things that we do warm the baby dry the baby stimulate warm the baby by keeping it under the temperature crib we dry the baby using the pre warm linen then we stimulate it by just by flicking the tone or rubbing the back of the baby then we position the baby by extending slightly extending the head over the neck then we open up the airway and we suction okay fine after this again we assess whether the baby has cried then okay fine if it is not then if there is baby is still having apnea if the baby is still gasping or if the heart rate is still less than 100 beats per minute if to any of this question is yes then we go ahead and do positive pressure ventilation we we'll have to connect pulse oximeter if ecg monitoring is available we we'll have to connect to that and start positive pressure ventilation positive pressure ventilation is done using this bag and mask appropriate size bag and mask with appropriate sized mask we we'll have to go ahead and give positive pressure ventilation this is nothing but ppv positive pressure ventilation we we'll have to give good positive pressure ventilation so that there is good chest rise fine next what do we do and this whole thing has to be done within one minute okay so this initial part needs to be done within one minute fine next so might be somewhere till here it is 30 seconds okay it is 30 seconds and then we do 30 seconds of positive pressure ventilation if the baby still doesn't respond if the heart rate is still less than 100 beats per minute then what do we do we do something called as ventilation corrective steps that is ensure adequate ventilation and this steps can be remembered by the by this mnemonic called mr sopa okay mr sopa the mnemonic goes as mr sopa ventilation corrective steps so this includes mask adjustment we'll have to adjust the mask we'll have to again reposition the airway again we do positive pressure ventilation and look whether there is adequate chest rise so adjust the mask reposition airway and see whether there is adequate chest rise as and when we give positive pressure ventilation to the baby we'll have to look for the chest rise correct so for this we assess whether there is adequate chest rise next what do we do if there is still no adequate chest rise then again open the mouth suction mouth followed by nose always suctioning is mouth followed by nose so that the baby doesn't aspirate okay fine next we open the mouth lift the jaw forward we open the mouth and lift the jaw forward so that position is proper fine so mr is over then so is over suction mouth and nose and adequately position it again we try positive pressure ventilation and we look for chest rise okay if this doesn't happen then we increase the pressure how do we increase the pressure in bag and mask ventilation we will have a valve to adjust the pressure so with that we increase the pressure again we assess do positive pressure ventilation and assess for chest movements whether there is adequate chest rise or not even after all this corrective steps if the baby does not improve then we'll have to go and think of alternate airway either in terms of et tube or laryngeal mask airway fine good so we have ensured adequate ventilation heart rate is still less than 60 beats per minute that is when we'll have to do intubate the child okay we'll have to intubate the child and start giving positive pressure ventilation with et tube 
if still heart rate is less than 30 seconds, if still heart rate is less than 60 beats per minute, then we'll have to start chest compression as well, okay? Then we'll have to start chest compression as well. As we see over here, we'll have to start chest compression as well. So how much deep to go? It has to be one third of the AP diameter. One third of AP diameter, fine. So this is how deep we go, fine. One third of AP diameter, we give chest, good chest compressions along with positive pressure ventilation in ratio three is to one. So for every three chest compressions, there should be one ventilation, fine. So that will be that will come up to somewhere up to 90 is to 30, 90 compressions is to 30 ventilation per minute. Fine. Okay, fine. So even with this, even with this, if baby doesn't improve, even with adequate positive pressure ventilation and chest compression, okay. Even with that, if the baby doesn't improve, then we'll have to think of drugs, correct? What is the drug we give? We give intravenous epinephrine, either intravenous preferred route is umbilical cord by, by putting a UVC, if that is not available, intratracheal as well can be given. And the dosage of epinephrine is, dosage of epinephrine is 0 0.02 mg per kg. We give epinephrine and flush it with 3 ml of NS. Okay, so this is the basic NRP algorithm. Fine. You guys can go through it once again if you want. Or if in detail, if it's you guys are more interested and if you want in details, there's already a video on this NRP done. So you can go through it and get your concepts clearly. So this was to do with basic NRP. So NRP includes introduction. If there is no abnormal, if there is abnormal transition, then comes the need for neonatal resuscitation. And these guidelines are given by ILCOR. Fine. And around five to ten percent of the cases improve with tactile stimulation. Three to six percent need wagon mask ventilation. And one to three around per thousand cases need ET tube or ET, uh, need intubation along with positive pressure ventilation. So in case of any antenatal or intrapartum risk factors, we'll have to anticipate abnormal transition. And based on the guidelines given by NRP, we'll have, which is based on the principle of TA, B, C, D, we'll have to follow the algorithm. Fine. The algorithm includes, first we assess for term, first we assess the child, whether we see whether the baby is term, whether the baby is having good tone, or whether the baby is breathing or not. If to any of this answer is no, we'll have to warm the baby, we'll have to dry the baby, then stimulate, position the airway, and we'll have to suction. If it doesn't improve with this as well, if there is still apnea, if the baby is still gasping, and if the heart rate is still less than 100 beats per minute, then we'll have to go ahead and give positive pressure ventilation. How do we give? Along with appropriate size bag and mask ventilation. With this, we'll have to give positive pressure look ventilation and look for whether there is adequate chest trace or not, fine. And this whole thing will take about one minute. Initially, up till this is 30 seconds and then 30 seconds of adequate bag and mask ventilation. Even with this, if heart rate is less than 100 beats per minute, then we'll have to think of whether we are giving whatever positive pressure ventilation we are giving is adequate or not. So how do we assess it? We go and do ventilation corrective steps given by the mnemonic MR SOPA. We'll have to adjust the mask. We'll have to reposition airway. We'll have to suction mouth and nose. We'll have to again position, reposition it, open mouth and lift the jaw forward. And again, increase the pressure and give positive pressure ventilation. Even after following this ventilation corrective steps, baby still doesn't improve, then we'll have to think of alternate airway. That is with ET tube or laryngeal mask airway. We'll have to insert ET tube, again, give positive pressure ventilation. Even with this, if baby doesn't improve, if heart rate is still less than 60 beats per minute, then we start, along with this positive pressure ventilation, we start chest compression as well. So how do we give this chest compression? In the ratio, three is to one. For every three chest compressions, we'll have to ventilate the baby once. We'll have to give positive pressure ventilation once with bag. Fine. 
even with this, if baby doesn't improve, if heart rate is still less than 60 beats per minute, then we go ahead and give epinephrine. Preferred is through UVC. If not, intratracheal canals will be given. Drug dosage for UVC is through IV channel if the dosage is 0 0.02 ml per kg, 0 0.02 mg per kg, fine, not ml, 0 0.02 mg per kg. After that, we flush it with 3 ml NS. Okay, so this was the neonatal distillation protocol algorithm. If you guys need to clear your concepts a bit, if you want to go more in depth, please go and watch the previous video on NRP. Fine? Fine. So we move on to the next topic. That is routine newborn care. Again, most of the times, 10 marker come from this routine newborn care. Any doubts till now? Right, so let me move ahead. So the next is next topic will be routine newborn care. Now, so this routine newborn care, one is at the time of birth. Okay. One part of it includes at the time of birth and the other part of it includes the initial few hours after birth. So just now we saw in our NRP protocol that at the time of birth, what are the three things we assess? We see whether it is term gestation or not. We see, look at the tone. And we look whether the baby is breathing or crying. Okay. If all, if question to all, if the answer to all three questions, these questions is yes, then we move ahead and come up to giving routine newborn care. Correct. So this routine newborn care is usually given to a normal newborn. Now, so the next question that automatically arises is whom do we call as normal newborn? So there have to be term baby with actively flexed stone. And they should be crying or breathing as we did that initial assessment. Fine. Next, there should be no major malformations or no birth trauma present. Birth weight should be between 10th to 90th percentile. Fine. And there is absence of any maternal illness or any of the antenatal or interpartum risk factors, which we have already read. And Abgar scores should be normal. Okay. The one minute and five minute Abgar scores need to be normal. So if to all these questions, answer is yes. Then we proceed to normal newborn care, routine newborn care. Fine. And this routine newborn care can be given in two parts. One is at birth and one is few hours following the birth. So care at birth, what are the things? We'll discuss in separate headings. Fine. So at the time of birth, even before we, as soon as we enter the labor room or as soon as we enter the OT, we'll have to first be equipped correct so one is equipped with good hands fine that we have already read at the time of delivery for every delivery needs to attend needs to be attended by one health provider who is trained in basic nrp and if any of the risk factors are present two trained personnel is needed so this was the hands that is needed to resist the child next is the equipment okay so before going for any Resuscitation before going to resuscitate any of the baby or before going to attend any of the calls that is given to resuscitate the child, we'll have to see the equipment checklist. So this is the basic equipment checklist. You guys don't have to remember. I just showed you the image that whatever equipments need to be present at the time of delivery of the child should be present and we'll have to go and make sure that all these equipments are present. So this is the basic checklist for resuscitation preparedness. So at the time of birth, even before the birth of the child, personal and equipment to be present at the time of delivery. Next is standard precautions. Okay, standard precautions and asepsis at the time of birth. So we'll have to follow the universal standard precautions, which we all know, fine. And we'll have to maintain strict asepsis, which includes the five C's. Five C's. Okay, so what are these five C's? Clean hands, clean surface, clean cut, clean thread, and clean cord. Okay, these are the five C's. Fine. So this was the standard precautions and asepsis that needs to be present at birth. Next, 
V is the prevention and management of hypothermia. So again, we give very much importance to temperature in newborns. Even in the algorithm, we saw that it was temperature followed by airway, breathing, circulation, and drugs. Because the admission temperature of a non-asphyxiated asphyxiated newborns strongly predicts the mortality of the child. So if the ad admission temperature is adequate, that is between 36.5 to 37.5 degrees Celsius, Okay, so that will correlate with the mortality of the child at the time of admission to NICU. Fine. So that is why we give so much importance towards prevention and management of hypothermia. Fine. This is a separate fine marker for you guys. So we'll discuss it, about it in detail. Fine. In the proceeding topic. Fine. So and the delivery room temperature as well needs to be ambient between 25 to 28 degree Celsius and Whenever we receive the child, we need to receive it with pre-warm sterile linen clothes so that the baby is warm. Next is skin to skin contact. Fine. Again, this is again the one of the most important aspects. Fine. So all vaginally delivered babies, or for that matter, babies who are delivered by C-section and they come and qualify the normal newborn definition, need to be put back to the mother itself. We should not give it hand over, hand it over to the attenders or we need not get the child to the resuscitation corner if they qualify the normal newborn criteria. We will have to put it back on mother's abdomen and chest. Why is it so important to do it within the initial one hour? Is because one, it maintains newborn temperature. Two, it promotes early breastfeeding, which is very, very important. Not only early breastfeeding, it also helps in the successful breastfeeding of the child as well okay it in even in the future it helps in the successful breastfeeding of the child fine and it's a third it decreases the pain and bleeding in the mother it decreases the pain and bleeding in the mother and it improves the mother and baby bonding as well so skin to skin contact is one of the most important aspect of this routine newborn care fine next is delayed cord clamping okay delayed cord Clamping, what we read as umbilical cord management, correct? In one of the four pre-birth questions, one of the thing was this, fine. So what does it say? At least 30 seconds and up to one minute, okay? Up to one minute is preferred, fine. One minute is the one which is preferred, okay? In order to allow transfer of additional amount of blood from placenta to infant, especially in country like India, where in the feeding practices are not fine. Even the complementary feeding practices are not fine. And most of the infants end up with anemia. Correct. So in that case, it is very, very important. Umbilical cord management plan. That is delayed cord clamping. So what are the advantages? One is there is high HB, increased iron stones in the newborn. Okay. There is better neurodevelopmental outcome in the newborn. There is better transition. So it decreases the need for resuscitation. If there is increased HP and RBC, decreased need of transfusion in the NICU as well as in the future, and there is decreased risk for necrotizing enterocolitis or interventricular hemorrhage. So, the delayed cord clamping comes with so many advantages. So, we'll always have to do delayed cord clamping. It is only not done, where is it not done in cases of placental abruption or bleeding placenta previa or cord abruption. So, these are the cases where it is not done, or else. We'll have to always do delayed corn clamping. Okay, fine. Next is drying of the baby. How do we dry the baby? As we have already discussed, to prevent hypothermia, we need to dry the baby with pre-warmed sterile linen clothes. Okay. And this drying as well has to be done on mother's abdomen because we'll have already done skin to skin contact. And it shouldn't be wiped in a harsh way. We'll have to do it in a gentle manner. Fine. Next is clamping of the cord. This should be done around two to three centimeter away from the abdomen using cord clamp. And this cord clamp needs to be sterile. Okay. Sterile cord clamp. Okay. Again, we will have to maintain asepsis. Sterile cord clamp. Next, we will have to record APGAR scores. One and five minutes APGAR score. If not normal, then we will have to go ahead and record 10, 15 and 20 minutes as well. Next is we will have to place an identity band. Okay. Especially in a busy setup, this becomes very important. We'll have to show to the mother the gender of the child and we'll have to place the identity band. Okay. Next is initiation of breastfeeding at the earliest possible opportunity. Within half an hour, preferably in 
normal delivery and within one hour in a cesarean mother and best answer we'll give is as early as possible okay next so this was the these were the routine newborn care principles which you have done at the time of the birth when the baby is born next is during the initial few hours after birth okay initial few hours after birth what do we do next we go ahead and do to, and recall the routine anthropometry of the child that is very important correct so we recall the weight of the child we recall the weight of the child and then we do the first examination of the child not uh, in detail examination because it is still in the initial first few hours of life but we'll have to do a quick assessment of the child wherein we look for appropriate signs for successful transition what were this we already saw baby should be crying or breathing with universally flexed position okay and baby should be comfortable next we'll have to do correct sex determination and show it to the parents mother as well as the attenders okay next we'll have to uh, we we'll have to document the anthropometrical parameters that is already we have discussed weight of the child and the length of the child and head circumference after 24 hours once the scalp edema and all is resolved after 24 hours if we do we will we'll get the appropriate head circumference and next is examine for the congenital anomalies how do we examine we look for the all the openings whether anal opening is present or not we whether mouth and nasal opening is present, we put a little finger and see whether cleft lip, cleft palate is present, correct? So we go and see for, and then we look at the spine, then we look at the limbs. If everything is proper, we'll have to look, do a quick assessment for any congenital anomalies are present or not. Next, we administer vitamin K at the time of birth, dose is being 0.5 mg for babies less than 1000 grams and 1 mg for babies more than 1000 grams. IM injection is given on the anterolateral aspect of the right thigh. We give administer vitamin K. Next, we counsel the baby. We counsel the family and mother regarding the routine newborn care, regarding breastfeeding, regarding the importance of breastfeeding, regarding the importance of mother uh, and child being together. So all this, and as we all know, they'll have n number of doubts, which we have to sit, counsel the family members along with the mother. Next is rooming in, <coughs> rooming in in nothing but in normal newborn should not be separated at any cost from the mother. So what we'll have to actually counsel is 24 bar seven mother and baby has to be together. So all the through, throughout the 24 hours, we shouldn't separate mother from the baby, okay? Next is care of the cord. We'll again have to counsel parents regarding care of the cord because there are many practices that they follow, which we'll have to counsel them again. And we'll have to also counsel that exclusive breastfeeding has to be done because again, some of the top feeds are given at the time of birth as part of cultural practices. Okay, that now comes as part of counseling itself. Gentle oil massage is recommended. Exclusive breastfeeding again as told. And many of them will ask as to when to bathe the child, correct? So sponging of the baby should be done once a day with clean water and deep bath, which most of the time parents will come and ask you, it should, it is usually done after one week. That is after the cord has fallen or baby is discharged from the hospital. And we'll have to tell that position of the sleep, better to avoid prone position because this avoids sudden infant death syndrome, okay? So this was to do with the routine newborn care. Next is when do we discharge the child in the new routine newborn care? When do we discharge a normal newborn? Usually 48 to 72 hours after birth. Okay. Early discharge may be considered for non primary mothers, non primary gravida mothers with history of successful breastfeeding. So, what are the few criteria that should be there? Routine formal examination should be done and documented. Routine immunization as per national immunization schedule should be given. Mother is confident enough and trained in handling the child and breastfeeding the child. No significant jaundice or any other illness is present in the newborn child as well as in the mother. And mother is breastfeeding the baby adequately. How do we see for adequacy of breastfeeding? Six to eight times per 24 hours, baby needs to pass urine. While sleeping, after breastfeeds, baby needs to be comfortably sleep for one to three hours and there is no excessive weight loss. Okay, there should be no excessive weight loss. That is 
between the, within the initial one week to 10 days of life, weight loss should be less than 10%. Okay. And we we'll have to again counsel and advise regarding exclusive breastfeeding for the further follow-up for national immunization schedule. If discharge done at within 24 to 48 hours life, we'll have to get them, call them back at 48 hours of life to look for jaundice. Okay, vitamin D supplementation that needs to give, be given until one year of age, that is at 400 international units per day. And we'll have to explain regarding the danger, signs and symptoms. This includes certain danger, signs and symptoms. Okay, so this was to do with the routine newborn care. So this is again one of your 10 marker. Next is evaluation of normal newborn. Evaluation of normal newborn. This includes examination of newborn as well okay so next question that will be asked is score which was given by virginia Abgar. so next question that will be asked is regarding Abgar score fine so this is the practical method of systematically evaluating the infants immediately after birth this is one of the practical methods so what does Abgar stand for a for appearance Pulse, grimace, activity of the child, and respiratory efforts. And 0, 1, and 2 is scoring given for each of this category. If there is baby is looking blue or pale, it is 0. If body is pink but extremities are blue, then it is 1. And if it is completely pink, it is 2. Next is pulse. If pulse is absent, 0. Less than 100 beats per minute, 1. More than 100 beats per minute, 2. Next is grimace. On stimulating the child, if, if there is no response, again, zero. If baby makes grimace exp exp facial expression, then it is one. If baby coughs or sneezes, it is two. Next is activity. If baby is absolutely limp, then it is zero. If there is some amount of flexion of the extremities, then we give score of one. And if there is active, universally flexed portion, position with... <coughs> active movements of the child, then it is two. Next is R, the last one, which stands for respiratory effort. No respiratory effort, zero. If it is slow and irregular, one. And if it is good and crying, it is two, fine. So what does this allow? This practical method allows us to assess the cardiopulmonary status of the child, rapidly assess the cardiopulmonary status of the child, fine. So change in APGAR score at sequential time points tells us how baby is responding to the resuscitation. Fine. The APGAR might have been two or three at birth. We give resuscitate a child properly. So at by five minutes, if the APGAR score is seven or eight by 10, then it shows us that the way we have resuscitated the child is successful. Correct. Baby has responded well to our resuscitation. Fine. And this should not be used as a guide for to start initial resuscitation because the only three things we ask at the time of birth is term, tone, and baby is crying or not. This might come from back. So immediately it should be used as a guide to start resuscitation. And this is not a predictor for long-term future development outcome as well. Okay. Fine. So when you measure at one and minute. If score is at five minutes, then we'll have to go ahead and do it until 20 minutes. Okay, 10 minutes, 15 and 20 minutes as well. Need to record. And these are of the factors that affect our upper score. When do we fall positive? Okay. In the absence of hypothesis, when, when does when do we see the upper score? That is in the majority. If mother
sorry, I just got disconnected. Uday Kumar, who is it? You have been assessed, uh, assigned as the host. Can you, could you please make me the host? Uday Kumar, who's on Zoom? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have to put, sir. Yeah. Done, okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm, sorry, sorry for the delay. I just got disconnected. So few of the false positive factors which show low of the scores can be prematurity or any of the drugs that is given to the mother, okay, congenital myopathy or congenital neuropathy. So these are the few of the examples. And false negative, if there is maternal acidosis present or high catecholamine levels in the fetus and some full-term infants might show false negative of score. So if you are asked as of score for five marks, you are expected to write these points. And few of the other questions that might be asked for your exam can be assessment of gestational age and how do we differentiate term, preterm and postterm infants and about birth trauma there can invariably be a question very important and how do you differentiate caput from cephalomatoma, primitive neonatal reflexes and morose reflex can be a question and trans transient neonatal phenomena. So these questions have been covered up in our previous uh, class on examination of newborn. All these things have been dealt in detail. So please go back and read these questions. Fine. So we'll be done with evaluation of newborn. Uh, okay. It's almost an hour. So other topics, we'll do it in the coming sessions. Fine. Guess any doubts or else we can end, wind up for today. We'll in the coming sessions, let's look at other topics. Any doubts? <coughs> okay. There doesn't seem to be any doubts. If any doubts, you guys can always message me. Fine. So this is my contact number. Okay, fine.